Good evening. My name is Chase Robinson, and I'm president of the Graduate Center, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you to, to tonight's event. Tonight, we are honored to host master choreographer, dancer, and director Bill T. Jones, who will discuss his boundary-breaking work with her own esteemed faculty member, Robert Reed Farr. So first, a word or two about the Graduate Center. As some of you will know, the Graduate Center is a graduate school of arts and sciences. It's a center for applied and theoretical research. It's a platform for performance, conversation, and public debate. As a community of students and scholars committed to the idea that learning is a public good, we regularly offer public programs featuring eminent thinkers, writers, artists, and indeed cultural leaders. Tonight's conversation will focus on the role of art and culture in breaking down boundaries of race, gender, sexuality, nation, and class. To those of you who are here just for the evening, I'll note that it is part of a two-day gathering which is honoring Stuart Hall, the late sociologist and cultural theorist. We're delighted to hear from an artist who spent so much of his career on the front line of the very issues that Stuart Hall concerned himself with, the formidable Bill T. Jones. Named an irreplaceable dance treasure by the Dance Heritage Coalition, Bill T. Jones is the artistic director and co-founder of Bill T. Jones' Arnie Zane Dance Company and executive artistic director of New York Live Arts. Mr. Jones has been a National Medal of Arts recipient a Kennedy Center honoree, and a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Award, among many other honors. He also won a Tony Award for Best Choreography. For many years, he has mixed video, text, and autobiographical material into his choreography, and I don't doubt that his reputation as a mesmerizing speaker will be confirmed tonight. Speaking with him will be Robert Reed Farr, distinguished professor of English and American studies here at the Graduate Center. He's also director of the Institute for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean. Robert is the author of Once You Go Black, Choice, Desire, and the Black American Intellectual, and Black Gay Man, essays among other books. Please join me in welcoming our guests. What did he say? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone, for being here. You all look gorgeous. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, welcome, Bill. It, I, the first thing I want to ask you is, have you been to the Graduate Center before? Uh, I've never been to the Graduate Center, but I have danced at the Cooney Mall, uh, on the, as I was telling you. Uh, well, the first thing to say is that that's crazy. You have to come here all the time. You have to think of this as your home. Wonderful. We wonderful. know that. We know uh, that there are those other institutions in the city, mm. uh, but this should be your home. So, oh, fantastic! Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now, I have to um, just to get started. I have to get my fan adulation out of the way a little bit, um, and just say a couple of things to you. Uh, the first thing I just wanted to say to you is thank you. Um, in I think it was 1990. I went to see um, Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. slash The Promised Land. The Promised Land, yes. At the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I think I'd never seen something quite that lush before in my life. <laughs> that, uh, that large, is that? That lush. Oh, that lush. That yeah, lush. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there were 70 naked people on stage. Easily, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were, you know, so... It was supposed to be 52 handsome But nudes. you know how naked people get yes. when, there's a, when there's a party with them. 
they just get going. Mm -hmm. And so literally, I was a graduate student with plenty of um, you know, graduate student angst. Mm -hmm. And so I was sitting in a nosebleed seat. I'm sure I couldn't afford it. And literally, I had these cartoon eyes like, woo, oh my gosh. <laughs> But it changed the way that, I, I walked out that day, no joke, and I was on the street in Brooklyn and I thought, gosh, if he can do that, then it changes what I can do as an intellectual. It radically changed who I was as That's a human wonderful. being, so I thank you for that. Wonderful. Um, and also, I just thank you for being so gorgeous and so amazing. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, would, I would say um, modestly, which is not my strong coat, um, the, um, that, that, that piece actually changed a lot of things in my world. Right. Uh, they, Meredith Monk did huge uh, multi-hour things, you know, with the large cast. Robert Wilson did the same. Uh, it was part of the vocabulary of the downtown uh, experimental community. But there was something about the, now we call it the uh, culture wars. Right. That I didn't, we didn't know, but that piece was a very important piece, because what happened was um, Arnie Zane, who is my companion, who was my companion, he and I had met at, when I was at the university in 1971, and he and I started this journey. We joined the American Dance Asylum, and then we took our, our careers, took us, separated right. us, we came to New York. One of the first performances was at the Cooney Mall. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is we had a very significant duet uh, career, and I don't think there had ever been two performers like us. Arnie was a five foot four Jewish Italian man. I'm a six foot one African American. We were coming from a lot of experimental ideas about who could lift whom and grappling and so on. We did a significant body of work, um, at least a trilogy that really defined what could happen between two people of such disparate temperaments and mm -hmm. body sizes. We formed a company, and then Arnie grew sick and died. And as he was um, growing sicker, he and I, we were in the habit of going to Harvey Lichtenstein, the wonderful, the great Harvey Lichtenstein at the Brooklyn Academy of Music with our new ideas. And Arnie had this idea, we were both in love with Jesse Norman, we didn't know her, and, we'd been, and I'd been reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, we saw Jesse on an ice floe in our imagination, mm. suspended over this stage of the Brooklyn Academy of Music. So we came with this idea, The Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin, featuring 52 handsome nudes. Sean Kern, who is now um, the dean of the Department of Dance at, uh, at, at NYU, was a dancer who worked at a, a very hip little shop called Little Ricky. I don't know if it's still there. And he gave us as a joke, he had a way of giving these very touching jokes, a deck of um, playing cards, soft, soft core, uh, male playing cards, you know, cowboys, Indians. I, I have those cards. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love, I'd love to see them sometime. The, uh, <laughs> so the idea was that he, he, we were going to do this piece and it was going to be called The Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin featuring 52 handsome nudes. Mm. That was like a real problem because this was around the time that Jesse Helms was on the floor right. of the legislature waving Robert Maplethorpe's book and so on. And so people, the presenters, it was going to be very in, intense for the pre presenters because they had to find me. Uh, I wanted them, the, a demographic that represented their cities. I wanted young, I wanted old, I wanted white, black, Asian, um, I wanted um, gay, straight, uh, all of those people. And they had to go out in their community and sell this idea with and I think people knew at that time that they were going to be asked to be naked in the final scene. So that was fine in certain places like Ann Arbor and so on, but when you get to Iowa City, mm -hmm. you know, and I tell this story, and I think you've read the books, you probably heard all of this, but that before we came, the audition had hit on the front page of the hard news. It said, uh, controversial choreographer comes to Iowa City inviting people to strut their stuff. All of it, you know? <laughs> so you can imagine, and it, it was tisk tisk, but it was sold out and people wanted to all be there. And it was, um, so what you, what you saw at BAM was the New York version of something that we took on tour through, I don't know, for two years, maybe 35 cities. You knew, I don't want to uh, spend all of our time talking about, uh, about mm -hmm. Uncle Tom's Cabin, but um, the, the lesson of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Mm -hmm. 
but one of the things about um, those individuals on stage was it, it wasn't that they were all uh, stereotypically handsome. No, not at all. Uh, no. There were a lot of body forms that were shocking to me to see. Um, I had never seen that type of person naked. Okay, a beautiful svelte dancer mm -hmm, naked mm -hmm. on the stage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it happens. Mm -hmm. But you know the types of person, the types of persons who you demonstrated, it was just really stunning. And I think back on it, the New York version, being that it is New York, could, was astounding. There was a man there who was. Uh, had been a, a playgirl, playmate. There was kind of like a regular Joe from Queens. Uh, you're probably referring to Lawrence Goldhuber, mm -hmm. who at that time was almost 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, there were Sage and John Coles. Um, uh, for those of you who know anything about the publishing industry, uh, John was a chairman of um, the, well, he was the, the editor of the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. And he and his wife, uh, Sage, who wonderful people, they in some ways ran away with the circus when they joined us. There was R. Justice Allen, who uh, had a young guy from Brooklyn who had a drug habit at age 19 and went with his friends to rob a store. They didn't get much money. Someone hit his hand. He shot a man. Um, Justice was in jail for 15 years mm. in Attica. Uh, so you're right. It was it was quite amazing. I'm not sure if we had any really young people there. Mm -hmm. The youngest person we had was probably 16 in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And when we toured in Washington, uh, Catherine Graham, who was a childhood friend of John Coles's, they of course they interviewed the caught the article, the nude paper man. You know, mm -hmm. they were very clever on the part of the media. And they asked her if she was going to go see her friend because they were childhood friends. And she said. Oh no no! I don't I don't look forward to seeing John and the all together. So, <laughs> so she didn't come. But you can imagine um, our four guest artists were two extremely uh, wealthy people from Minneapolis, very much very very important political people. Um, a young African American man, Andre Smith, who was an actor who played our Uncle Tom, and then our Justice Allen, who was um, like I say had been in Attica all those years and was a rapper. So those were our guest artists. It was, it was an amazing moment, almost as amazing as the moment we're going through right now, I right. think, right. in terms of, um, of culture and identity. You know, I wanted to um, talk a little bit, get you to talk a little bit about your, uh, both your background, your family background and your personal background, but also uh, your artistic development. Mm -hmm. And really the question in my head is how does a well-raised black man um, <laughs> actually make the change to being a person who feels that it's okay to uh, be a modern dancer and to be a person who can move his body in the, in the ways that you have moved your body to choreograph other people, especially given that uh, you're quite open about the fact that you came from a poor family, actually. A very poor family, yes, yeah. yes, yes. We were potato pickers, uh, migrant workers. Well, what can I say? I think I had the luck of the draw. My, my companion, uh, Bjorn Amla, and I say that we were very, very lucky because I was born in 52. Um, as you know, Brown versus the Board of Education it was at uh, 54, right? Mm -hmm. The March on Washington, um, Stonewall, Woodstock, um, all of those major liberal left-wing phenomena happened when we were growing. And then we even got to experience the, sec the sexual revolution before AIDS. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things happened. Uh, my parents, Really, my mother and father both from Georgia. Uh, my father probably had a sixth grade education. My mother had a fourth grade education. They were overwhelmed. They had that we had white friends. Um, I could I could ask a white girl to go to the prom. And my older brother's like, man, you know, you don't know what the, you don't know what this means. You know, uh, you know they were, and they were my friends. I'd gone to school K through 12 with them because my parents decided to stop migrating just before I started kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Out of 12 kids, I'm number 10. So 10, 11, and 12 were all Yankees. Right. And everybody else would be in and out of six school systems a year. This is a way of saying that it was a wonderful time to be alive. But you know, the thing that strikes me about it is, is I can understand how you can come out of that milieu, how you can be effectively a product of desegregation in this country. Mm -hmm. And become- And the counterculture. That's what hits me. It's not that you've become um, simply an artist. It's that you've become an artist who specifically has 
basically broken every rule that there was to break. <laughs> and um, you at know, a time when rules were being broken. What do you mean by that? Don't you think? This is a, a very important conversation I had once with Toni Morrison about um, how everyone loves to rag on the irresponsibility of the 60s and, and so on. But you know, the 60s was a, t was a time when things were possible. People were with drugs or what have you, but th people were thinking way outside their comfort zone. There was, it was a, and uh, we, you find yourself, I was trying to talk to somebody, it wasn't the 60s, it was probably 1970, my brother and I decided to, like thousands of others, put your thumb out and go discover America. Here we have, I start from Springwater, New York, my brother in, Wa in Rochester, New York, Route 90 all the way across. Um, well, the first day busted with, um, in those days, excuse the references to drugs, but drugs are more sinister now, but we had little speed on us. Police busted us, but did not arrest us. And you know, you know, keep the peace, baby. You know, this is what the state troopers are saying. We hitchhike <laughs> some, yeah, 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 yeah. We hitchhike and somewhere in the Midwest, I remember being at a rest stop where there were thousands of young people. Uh, I met a young woman and a man who were barefoot, who had started somewhere near the Mexican border with just t-shirts, barefoot. And you, did they have bottoms on? No, they had no, sh they were barefoot. No, I'm, oh. t-shirts and shoes. Okay. <laughs> yes, they had bottoms on, but you know, that clothes were, as you can imagine, clothes were, were mm -hmm. not necessary at all times. And uh, <laughs> so it was a time when everybody was sort of redefining what it was. When I met Ernie Zane, um, he, he was, I, was, I had had been relationships only with women, but I knew that I wanted to have this experience. I met Arnie Zane and we began to, this relationship uh, with listening to the Rolling Stones and Bessie Smith and Barbara Streisand. You know, Barbara Streisand in my world was not cool, but in the young gay man from New York, he was, she was very cool. And we, um, we started this adventure. It just seemed we were in a commune. You know, you know, it was my race, this is a problem maybe. It was a time when if you just didn't talk about race, you could live in these alcoves, uh, they, uh, I'm sorry, these, 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 these groups of people who call themselves hippies or what have you. Nobody talked about race, nobody mm -hmm. talked about gender. And it was, it was pretty cool for a while, you know, until I realized that there was a lot not being talked about. And that is when things began to change in my art and what have you. The, work, the first works that Ernie and I did were not overtly about anything political except our bodies were politicized and we didn't know it. You know, part of the reason that I, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so interested in this is that um, when I was getting ready for this conversation, I watched um, an interview that you did with Julian Bond. Yes. And it really struck me because um, last year I did a, a public conversation with Julian Bond. Oh, yes. And mm -hmm. so Wonderful wa man. watching the two of you, I thought, gosh, they seem very similar to <laughs> me. How so? How so? You said in that interview that you'd met Sidney Poitier. Yes. And that it was an ecstatic experience. Mm. And uh, I thought, well, I met Julian Bond, and it's an ecstatic experience. <laughs> and I'm meeting Bill Jones, and it's an ecstatic experience. And I just think, gosh, this, that for me is a line of uh, impossibly elegant, cultured, cosmopolitan, well-spoken black men who I literally was raised to be like. I really literally was raised to be like. That's him. wonderful, but did... Uh, and I, the fact that you then became a, uh, an artist who um, was countercultural with speed and no shoes and whatever the and thing was. And uh, LSD, dropped LSD at well, Woodstock. Uh, well, Woodstock. you know, yes. whatever happened. No, but this is the, <laughs> those, were, those, were, uh, those were defining moments though. Mm -hmm. You have to realize Woodstock, no matter what people say about it right now, was a really important moment. Mm -hmm. You cannot imagine what it's like to be a 17-year-old with the description I've been coming from potato pickers, which I've been living in the North uh, since 1955. I was born in 52. And um, going off to this on a whim one afternoon, my brother and his Irish Catholic uh, wife, we all trundled into his car. He was just running away from his job as a black Worker, black man at IBM, mm -hmm. you know, wingtips, mm -hmm. suit, and the whole bit. And we went out and we met the counterculture, literally, traffic and 
like this, and like I say, we were stuck in traffic, and a state trooper directing. And we said, man, what's going on? He said, it's the age of Aquarius, man. Wow. <laughs> you know, so, so you know, it's the age of Aquarius. So this is, you had to be there, you know? You had to be there. And, and, and being in the back of a, of a U-Haul truck, we, I had my girlfriend at that time, we had made a pact that we would not do LSD because it would ruin your chromosomes. Remember that? No. You don't remember that. No. Right? Don't try LSD, it will ruin your chromosomes. Is that true? Well, I don't know. I don't think it's true. <laughs> I know a lot of people who did have children. They, they look, they're fine to me, and we were all stoned together. But, the, the, but I'm in the back of this truck, and, I'm, and, it's, and it's the big storm, the legendary storm is coming up. I'm completely with strangers in my Jimi Hendrix mode, the vest, and the, these beads in my hand begin to glow with life. And there is no distance, there's no separation between me and other people, and, the, and there's the this black cavern becomes immense as the universe, and then the back opens, and I'm walking out, and everyone, it looks like a cross between the most euphoric picture of mankind and something about the Blitz or something in England, because everyone is bedraggled and covered with dirt and walking, and I'm all alone. I've lost my brother, and I have to, I am, where am I, who am I? All those questions were literally this crowd that was self-assembling. And then sleeping it off, having really scary hallucinations, in back in my brother's car, parked in a field a mile from the, and hearing Jimi Hendrix and the Star Spangled Banner wow. come over the mountain, right? This is a 17-year-old. So yeah, it sounds like just another druggy story, but it was, <laughs> it was a really important rite of passage about what was possible, mm -hmm. you know, what was possible. And this is probably a year or two before I met Arnie Zane, before I defined myself as a modern dancer. I really want us to talk a little bit about, um, uh, uh, more than a little bit about your relationship uh, with Arnie Zane. Uh, but before we get to that, I, it just strikes me that the way that we talk about um, the late 1960s, the early 1970s, mm -hmm. is, if, is as if it has failed. Um, and uh, particularly because... I don't speak that way about it. Do you feel that way, that it failed? You know, I'm not of that generation. In 1970, I was five. So, you know... <laughs> those were a lot of years ago. <laughs> those were a lot of years Imagine ago. Imagine how I'd feel. And, you know, I was, uh, but anyway, so, you know, I, was, I was 20 in 1970. One of the things that, uh, that makes me think about it is that, in fact, the sexual liberation uh, movement happened in this country, the women's rights movement happened in this country, the gay rights movement, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. civil rights movement in some ways blossomed. Mm. But the truth of the matter, we did have the AIDS crisis. Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980. Things did change drastically. New York City has become a wildly different city. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether or not that sense of possibility that you had as a 20-year-old listening to Jimi Hendrix's voice bound across the mountain mm -hmm. while you're sleeping off things, mm -hmm. is that was, that, it, was that in fact a feeling that's still with you? Is that, a sti that inspiration still there? Well, you're asking a really heavy question of, a, I'd say one of the tragedies of being, defining oneself as a maverick when you're young, is that middle age, you find not only parts of your anatomy drooping, but your, um, your ideals. Your, all those things, also you go through, something happens with gravity. Now, the trick is not to get stuck there. Mm -hmm. So where does hope live? Where does that kind of um, excitement about um, ideas? Art making is participation in the world of ideas. Mm -hmm. Art does for me what religion traditionally did. It organizes a seemingly chaotic universe. All those ideas, I think, are ideas that come from that period. Yeah. Um, I do have my depression. I, matter of fact, I'm a depressive person. I, I started therapy six years ago because I was, um, when so many things were going well professionally, I still felt, didn't feel good. Right. So I've thought a lot about that, but I don't know. I, as my mother would say, it makes me want to shout when you ask that question. You How know? so? You know, Agnes Martin said, the great painter, when a beautiful rose dies, beauty does not die, hmm. because beauty is not in the rose. A cultural movement, 
quote, dies. The best things about that movement do not die because they were not there in the first place. Where are those things in you, in us right now? Now, let's talk, I have, um, I've made, I'm, I'm, I'm from potato pickers. I've made a career making this esoteric art form called contemporary dance and performance. I know the, sometimes I sit and I look at my uh, associate artistic director, the first since Arnie died, Janet Wong, woman born in Hong Kong, raised in Singapore. She is uh, as close to me artistically as my companion Bjorn Amelon, a man born in Haifa in, in Israel. Um, the three of us are sitting around a table and we're talking and I'm thinking, who are these people? How do I happen to be so intimate, so in love with these people? My organization is run by women. All organizations are run by women. <laughs> <laughs> well, so then, so then you have your answer. Then, then you have your answer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The organization is run by women, and today, it, there's uh, sitting outside of New York Live Arts, two one nine, West Nineteenth Street. I'm walking down, and I see two brothers, and they don't look at all comfortable in Chelsea, and they're walking by, and then next to us is a is the G Bar, which is a gay bar, and they have posters of some show or something with buff, beautiful, naked gay men. And these guys, oh man, there's a lot of gay down here, you know? And I thought, I wanted to say, hey brother, have you been paying attention? <laughs> you know? Have you been paying attention? I, I really truly wanted to without confronting him because he literally, he jumped when he saw there's a lot of gay here. Have you seen Empire? Anybody watch Empire? Come on, don't be shy. Hold your hand up. <laughs> yes, right. You should. You owe it to yourself. It is an anthropological moment that we're having. You know? This show is really big news with black people, and yet the most sympathetic character on the show is the gay singer's son who's coming out. I'm wondering, how is this playing in the black church? Because it's got everything else, the realness, the hip hop, the whole, the swagger, all that. But then how can you have two guys making out interracially, in the first one, interracially, and the mother walks in, you know, says something about, you faggots, get out of that bed. But she's loving her son. She calls him a faggot and all, but there's a kind of a, a realness. So what happened to the 60s? We don't need, we don't need the 60s anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, if we just let it, let it happen, there we can actually surprise ourselves, those of us who are baby boomers. If we really let, if we get out of the way, it, it, can, it can happen again. Yeah. You, you, I'm assuming that you know, but maybe you don't, right. that much of the reason, uh, you know, people have admiration for you, hmm. and then that admiration resonates back, and they have even more admiration, hmm. because, um, you are a Kennedy Center honoree. Mm. Uh, you are a MacArthur Award winner. Mm. You have won, I believe, two Tonys. <laughs> you, um, I believe, received um, the National Medal of the Arts from um, Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And now you are, you have, are here. <laughs> I am really. <laughs> I know. My cup runneth it's over. It's taken you a while. Say. It's taken you a while. <laughs> but you needed, a, you needed some development. You, you know? need your own show. You are <laughs> you know? such a wit. You need your <laughs> own TV show. You know. But I think that, I hope that you know that part of the reason that you're held in such great high regard mm -hmm. is not because you are such a fantastic dancer and choreographer and director. and Retired people. dancer. We're going to get into that. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to get into that. We really are. Because I don't believe it. Um, but that you're a black person and you're a gay person. Mm. And you are out about being HIV positive as well. And you are continually, throughout, the, ever since his death, you've talked about the death of Arnie Zane uh, very, very openly. Well, the name Arnie. stays in the company. Bill T. Jones, Arnie Zane Dance Company. What I'm saying is mm -hmm. there are ways in which uh, your celebrity and the affection that people feel for you is not simply because of what you have done, but because ah. of the package that it comes in. Mm. Do you think that that's true? Do you see that? Of 
course, I have to acknowledge that. But you know, it's, uh, it's barbed. Because uh, when I was doing works like Uncle Tom's Cabin or just my early solos, actually, the, the, what the critical establishment can always get you with is, yeah, it's a good story he has, but it's not very good art. Yeah, it works better as politics than art. Mm. So I hear what you're saying, but we have to be careful there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like um, people who want to say that, uh, God, black people, they have such natural rhythm. <laughs> now we're all too sophisticated to say that anymore, right? Yeah, but he was so moving and he's HIV positive. Mm. Don't do that to me. Keep that bullshit to yourself. Mm. Don't do that. Nobody gets out of here alive. One in four women in this room will succumb to breast cancer. Mm. So it's not about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for everything. But I have to face myself every time I make a work. Is it because you have such a story? Mm -hmm. Or is it because you got something? Yeah. You have Skip Gates. He, in interviewing me some years ago, he was asking about my writing, and he was, I had written just a book, and he said, well, you know, black oration is dead on the page. You get that? Black oration is dead on the page, which means you need a strong performer to make it come alive. Hmm. And therefore, and that's somehow cheating. I'm talking to a self-described intellectual in a building built around, a, well, in a conference dedicated to a great intellectual. Mm -hmm. You know, now I've read uh, his work. I've not read your work. I've read his work. This is a person who understood what Skip was saying and could actually meet, I, could he, he could meet all the challenges of his story and he was a first rate intellectual mind. Can I meet all the challenges put down by Mr. George Balanchine, Martha Graham, Merce Cunningham, Tricia Brown, Mark Morris, Stephen Petronio, all of these people, um, Mr. Ailey, of course. Mm -hmm. Do I have the chops? Can I really move people around on stage? Can I do that? And at the same time, when you ask, who is this Arnie Zane person? Mm -hmm. Then you get the story. Yes, they were met when Bill was 19. Arnie was an art history student. They were together. They built this company. Uh, Arnie died in Bill's arms of complications from AIDS at mm -hmm. their house in upstate New York. Bill himself is HIV positive since 1985. Yes, it's, it's really, really touching, isn't it? Bullshit. Mm. You know? Bullshit. Not interested. You know? You know? You're wondering where this is coming from, this profanity and so on? <laughs> yeah? Do you wonder how one can be disgusted when people are feeling love for you? Yeah. And it's disgusted. I'm a bit like on right now. I embrace people who embrace me, but they got to realize, embrace me for what I'm aspiring to do, mm. not for the story that I tell, mm. you know? Okay. You know? Okay. Um, can we talk a little bit about, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about your, uh, your, your predecessors, particularly yes. your relationship to Merce Cunningham and to John Cage. To uh, Marcel Proust? Also to Marcel Proust. I would love <laughs> if, if you want to talk about Proust for the rest of the evening. No, 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 not for the rest. But <laughs> Proust. You go right on. I read Proust in 1970. 677 when I was a masseur at the Jewish Community Center in Vestal, New York. And I sat for hours. Nobody wanted any, any massage. They wanted a towel. They want to come in. And I, so what do I do? I'm reading the research, right? And then thinking about that's what he has to say about history and all of those things through the lens of Estella Jones, Gus Jones. And it, it really influenced the way I thought about how uh, personal narrative Storytelling, speech, works into art making. Um, so he was very important. Stan Brackage, Michael Snow, that whole, um, uh, Peter Kubelka, uh, Joyce Whelan, all of that generation of avant-garde filmmakers who were what uh, 
um, uh, a great film uh, critic whose name escapes me right now described as non-narrative cinema. Right. So already cinema does not have to tell stories. Cinema is just a series of pictures moving rapidly by a light source, something that Arnie Zane and I were very much took to heart when we started making movement, it's pictures. Mm -hmm. And we would play it forward and backwards as if you were using an analytical projector. Merce Cunningham was important because Merce Cunningham had danced with the great queen, Martha Graham, mm -hmm. but he had had John Cage whisper in his ear, and this I'm not sure if I've ever been given John, but he, but he was important for modern dance. Get away from that woman, Merce, she's become too literary. Because um, let's face it, you know, America, what America had to offer after the war was Jackson Pollock throwing paint. Um, the advent of the experiential, the, um, we, didn't, we no longer wanted stories about psychology. We no longer wanted um, like drama. It was about the elemental, the raw facts mm -hmm. of existence. John Cage was asking people to get rid of all their ideas about composition, about, uh, about, about literally seeing, rethink everything, get the ego out of it. I don't know if artists can ever really get the ego out of it, but that's another issue. And these things, for a generation like my own, it says you can make it up any way you want. You can do anything, and there, you can even stare, dare stand on the stage and not have a strong ballet training. Why? If your concept was strong enough. The concept is that I'm going to run and walk around this room for eight hours. You are welcome to come and watch. I'm going to change. There's going to be drama. He's going to get tired. There's going to be all sorts of things occurring because literally the event is not in the genius making a, a masterpiece. The event is in something about the perception, perception in time and space. Those were very, very important concepts that liberate the people and liberate them to today. So why would I want to make a piece called The Last Supper at Uncle Town's Cabin, yep. The Promised Land? There's that. I, the thing that kills me about it, <laughs> the thing that kills me about it is that I've been, I know um, uh, from having seen your work and I also know from having read you and also having looked at a fair amount of interviews with you that you talk extensively about having been influenced by um, artists who were both experimental, people who were really opposed to mediocrity, um, people who really were about breaking disciplinary boundaries. What strikes me is that I kept wondering, is that the artist that he is today? And is that the artist, is that, the artist that you are today? I'll ask you that. Well, it's hard to stay um, an iconoclast at every phase of one's career. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those uh, sobering things about middle age. When somebody first called me an iconoclast in a review, I said, no, because an iconoclast, an icon, sits on a shelf and gets dust until some young Turk comes along and smashes it. Right. I don't want to be either one. And that is where I'm at right now. You know, how to keep moving, be true to yourself, but at the same time, can you still learn? Can you still surprise yourself? Now, how is that done? That's why I did story time with John, with the, the, the book that you right. are, are referencing. Because John Cage had said, after a crisis, a similar crisis in the, in the 40s and the 50s, he was looking for a way out of everything he knew. And he chose chance procedure and indeterminacy to do that. Mm -hmm. I dipped into that over the last few years just to test, one, how does it rejuvenate? And two, what is the distance between John Cage and myself? And there, First of all, it's a wonderful system. I recommend it in all of everyone's life, uh, finding a way to use indeterminate means to organize one's production. But also, it was something about our discussion around culture. I contend that John Cage and a lot of modernists uh, were able to succeed because there is something granted to men, white men, I think white people, that they can be neutral. 
you can do certain things because if you perform in a certain way, if you, you are actually neutral. Hmm. I've never felt neutral. Right. Particularly in a cultural environment. Now we're all friends here, and quite frankly, it's even as I'm doing racial looking, it's surprisingly diverse, right? I can't see the religious, uh, I can't see it religiously. You know. It's surprisingly diverse. I'm sure it is. Yeah. I, I can feel it, right? So uh, I think that when I took on John Cage's strategies of indeterminacy, writing my stories, the stories come out a different way. Yeah. John, Car John Cage, Irish American, um, born in a very conventional uh, society and a different time. Um, he and I, I'm coming from a family of uh, 12 African Americans. Um, there was nobody in my family had ever been to university mm -hmm. and so on. So when I start talking about the, in that kind of aleatoric way that he does in his, his, his stories, the stories come out laden with race, class, history, violence, sex, not laden, but they're, they're, that's, what it, that's what it's made of. And I'm not complaining. I love being an African-American person. Mm -hmm. But when I try to talk off the cuff about my experiences, oftentimes it seems something political is going on in it. Yeah. Who knew? Mm -hmm. Who knew? You all get the semiotics of this moment? <laughs> right? Yeah? Who knew? <laughs> yeah? The semiotics of this moment? Yeah. When did that happen? This is just a man holding his hands up, right? It suddenly changed. And there's a whole discussion around this moment. Mm -hmm. The whole life has been like that. The first time there was ever a person on television in this small town I come from selling dial soap. And she was a very attractive black woman that got out of the shower. Do you know everybody the next day talked about that at school? You know, people who were decent people made jokes. She doesn't look clean. Yeah. You know, like that. Uh, Sidney Poitier. Right. Yeah. Sidney Poitier was, we loved him. We loved him. Why? Well, Lily's at the field. He was stupendous. But he was everything we were told that we should be. I was even, the first time I did Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech backwards. Um, it was a piece that made it into the uh, section of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Mm -hmm. um, last at free, last at free, all almighty God thanks, last at free. Mm. Um, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, I'm free at last. Well, it was because it was going to be in a solo called I Am Not Sidney Poitier. Um, so when I met him that night, there was something um, like meeting myself. Right meeting a projection of myself, and he was a person. And he and I, actually there was no screen between us, but there were actually two men there. Right. So, yeah. Can we talk just a little bit about um, your movement into commercial uh, mm -hmm. um, theater in particular? Uh, I have to say I'm a big fan of Fela. Did you enjoy Fela? Oh my god. Did you yes. do the clock? I did. <laughs> you know, so, um, and also of Spring Awakening, which I also happened to be able to see. Uh, how did you make that move from being um, a dancer who was certainly not, you're not a marginal dancer, Filthy Dance, you know uh, that. I'm not, I'm not. Um, but a person who definitely has spent most of his career doing sort of in-your-face work that was uh, explicitly avant-garde to doing um, Broadway, even though the Broadway that you did is also might be thought of as avant-garde as well. It's odd, you know, you. It's like your voice, you know? It's like what you, the timbre of your voice and so on. Well, you know, uh, uh, Spring Awakening, I don't know if you know it, uh, based on a, a Vedican um, expressionist drama, I believe, was it written in 1898? Somewhere in the 1890s. So scandalous in its subject matter, it was not performed unedited until the 1970s. Um, Michael Mayer, the brilliant director, who was Hedwig and Angry Itch and so on, he had seen my work at Aaron Davis Hall uptown, and uh, he was thinking about this work that, about youthful rebellion in, uh, in repressed Catholic Bavaria of 1893. So he had this idea that when the, it would be a period piece, but whenever the, the young people sang their truth, they would reach in and take out a microphone. It was a rock opera. 
It was a brilliant, brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. And he wanted somebody, because he showed me a video of something at that time, it was called MySpace, I think it was called. And they showed a young guy uh, with just his boxers on in his bedroom with a brush singing like this in his bedroom, you know, like, you know, people post online. He said, when they move, I want them to have this feeling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that's how I got invited into that. He had seen the work I had done in Aaron Davis Hall. He thought I was a choreographer who knew how to work with people that were not necessarily doing virtuosic um, jazz or ballet movement. Uh, Fela um, was brought to me by uh, a wonderful man who was on my board. His name is Steve Hendel. He and his wife, Ruth, um, have, she, they've invested in a lot of shows, but he had a love for the music of this uh, Nigerian firebrand, mm -hmm. Fela. He fell in love with it. He thought that he wanted to introduce him to a whole new uh, world, and Broadway would be the portal into that. We learned a lot about Broadway <laughs> with it. And so he invited me to, um, to direct it and develop a treatment. Mm -hmm. And after two years of negotiating uh, with uh, the various lawyers, it took a lot, and the family. Uh, for instance, a quote, and or as we wrote in our prospectus, Jim Lewis and I, an orgy had to become a, a birth ritual. Right. Yeah. So you could Sort of the same thing. Yeah, yeah, sort of the same thing. Yeah, yeah you couldn't say that. So um, when, when the piece actually um, succeeded off Broadway, I was so surprised yeah. that it was moved to Broadway. And um, it was doing really, really well. Um, did you, by any chance, read Charles Isherwood? No. no. Um, he's a smart man, but you know, the opening night, um, Ben Brantley gave a review from heaven to the work. Right. A review from heaven about leaving the theater floating and everybody should dance like this and so on and so forth. He praised Saar and uh, Kevin Mambo. A month goes by. Charles Isherwood comes and calls it a high, not, not a high tech, but a high tech minstrel show. Mm -hmm. And these beautiful head wraps and all, you know. Uh, Marina Dragic, uh, brilliant costume designer who's probably won several Tonys for her. She had really rethought the grandeur of those uh, gala and what have you. Mm -hmm. And the fabrics were outrageous. She shopped in Harlem, she shopped in Queens. They were much praised. And he said the uh, women looked like uh, wrapped up Christmas gifts. And that the show was, um, it was, People were sweaty with their shirts off and, and trying to seduce you, you know. This is about Africans in the shrine with Fela, smoking pot, doing, and, and doing politics all together. And suddenly it was, and he was totally, he was dismayed that I, we would be putting on this, this display in front of a room full of white people. Yeah. Now, but he started the article by saying, Far be it from me to tell black people about race. <laughs> but then he went on to say that it was a menstrual show that we were sweating and trying to seduce and da 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 right? What was that? Why was, why was there that, that corrective a month after the greatest review that I think I could imagine getting? Right. Why, what was that about? Why did we have to correct them? And that was an important musical on Broadway. It was really important. Mm -hmm. You say avant-garde, I say we talk about innovation in the American theater, we talk about innovation, we want it. That was innovation. Mm -hmm. It was. So what's this, this drag about it? And why did it come? Because why was it? You know, in that, that night that was reviewed, Dinah Ross was there, Denzel Washington was there. You know, it was a, in the row I was in the night he came. But yet, it was a shame because it was all for white people. Mm. And we were putting ourselves out there and for white people. What was that? Wait a minute. I'll ask. What was that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not objective. Well, we don't want you to be objective. Well, then maybe you should speak to what you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> So it was not really a good show. I think you were being disciplined. 
Mm -hmm. Policed, as they say. For being a bit too good. Mm. Mediocre would have been better. <laughs> Mediocre is often the goal. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe you're, you may be right. You may be right. I don't know about being too good, but actually um, it hadn't been sanctioned mm. somehow. Mm. Yeah. Okay, but that's very unprofessional considering I'm still very much in the game. I have three musicals coming down the pike now. So any of you, don't tell him I said this tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I, now I've done it. You know. All right. <laughs> All right. So we're going to run out of time in a minute. And we have to oh, do two shoot. things really quickly. You said how much time you wanted to talk. I know, talk. and I've been talking a mile a minute, haven't I? You know, you know um, can't help it. We have two things that we have to do. You have to talk a little bit about um, New York Live Arts. Mm. Go. <laughs> <laughs> New York Live Arts is a four-year-old entity that is the, the joining of Bilty Jones, Arnie Zane Dance Company, and the historic uh, Dance Theater Workshop at 219 West 19th Street. It uh, services artists at every stage of their career, movement-based artists. Um, it has, uh, this is a place that many, many great choreographers, American choreographers and international choreographers have come through, if not, in fact, um, launched their works. And I am the artistic director of New York uh, live Arts, even though we have a programming director, the very talented Tom Kriegsman, who actually makes the selections about our programming. I am there to, well, trying to steer it in a certain direction and make it a viable model in a time where such spaces are uh, endangered. Yeah, I just will say I was also there for that great James Baldwin. James Baldwin, uh -huh. fantastic. Yeah. Really. We have a we have a humanities series called Live Ideas. The first year was with a great Oliver Sacks. His 80th birthday. Did you all read his, uh, his, his article, the, the essay? Very wonderful. Uh, the second year was the 90th, 90th birthday of James Baldwin, which would have been nine, his. And the third year is curated by Laurie Anderson. Uh, it's called um, Sky. And um, it's a week of events, uh, music, theater, dance, discussion. And uh, it will be happening on April 14 for, for a week, and you should come down, catch an event. They're really, really fascinating. And then the second thing we have to do, and then we'll open up for some questions from the audience, is that you have to tell us all the wonderful things that you're inviting us to in the future. <laughs> inviting you to in the future. Well, there's going to be a great talk uptown with Carol Becker at Columbia in a few weeks. Um, the, con the company is launching a, a new work based on an oral history of my companion, my husband, Bjorn Amelon's 95-year-old mother, a woman born in Strasbourg, um, who uh, was 19 when the Second World War broke out. And she had a revelation that there are two kinds of people in the world, those who need help and those who give help. Um, she, her mother died uh, eight days after the Nazis walked into Belgium where they were living in Antwerp. So I did an oral history with her soon to be 16 years ago uh, that I did as a gift to her son, my companion, and his brother Ronnie, who lives in Paris, in which she tells stories. And I just asked her to talk me through the war. Of course, it's much more generous than that. And now we've divided that into uh, 21 episodes. My dancers are required to learn this text. One person is Bill T. Jones's voice, the other is Dora Amelon's voice, and Dora is a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, so, and that's called the trilogy, it will be a trilogy, it's called Analogy. This part is called Dora Tramontan. And for those of you who speak French, Tramontan is, is, a, is the, a, a, a wind in the south of France, which is where she encountered um, it while working at Rivesalt and Gers, those are two internment camps um, the Vichy government kept. And she was a young Jewish woman who was allowed to work there uh, as she was a member of a Jewish organization that had an underground uh, branch taking Jewish children out of the south of France to Switzerland and wherever. wherever. So Dora, Tramontan, and that will be premiering at the Castor Theater on June June 18th and probably run for four performances, right? You see why I don't have to memorize anything? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and and uh, there's uh, two musicals. One of them about a, a film, um, not a Bollywood film, no, 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 but the other, a very, very successful Indian film and it now being made into a musical. I'm choreographing it. The director of the film is directing it. And um, another one that I just heard about that I'm, takes place in five points. The music is uh, Stephen Foster. Do you love Stephen Foster? Now, who doesn't know who Stephen Foster is? Oh, good. We got a very educated audience. Is that? Uh, it's Swanee River, right? That's one of his tunes. I dream of Jeannie with the light brown hair. And it's, all, it's built around the draft riots that took place in New York at that time when Stephen Foster was down on his luck and um, an alcoholic, actually. Uh, it takes place in a mixed club, mixed bar, with the, the owner's name is Nellie Bly. Uh, and, and it's really delightful and deeply felt. And I believe, I won't say who the director is, I'm choreographing it, but I, the director is um, uh, a really wonderful man who I'm sure you knew his work, but I better not say it until the contract is signed. <laughs> no, at least, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now, 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 I think that the protocol is that we're going to take um, right at half an hour um, worth of um, questions from folks maybe 25 minutes. Um, uh, but um, So if you're going to ask questions uh, to Mr. Jones, you have to line up at the mics to do it. And please, I'm just going to ask everyone to make them um, as brief as possible, because we do want to stay within, uh, within our, our time limit, if that's OK. And do you mind if I stand up while I talk, while we answer questions? Um, you can do as you will. Yeah, great. <laughs> and I think we we're going to bring the light, house lights up, weren't we? Or is that the house light? I think we're going to bring the house lights up. So you cannot. Perhaps that's, perhaps that's happening now. There's a lady with her hands. Whoa, talk about assertive. You know, I way in the back there. I see her. We're not doing the microphone? Pardon? False alarm? Well, she didn't mean it? OK. She just was getting the spirit. She was <laughs> like, she was feeling it. Um, Hello. Hi. Um, I hope it's okay if I take this conversation in a slightly different direction. Um, I'm a dancer. I'm a lifelong dancer. My mother said I was dancing at two. I remember not dancing. I can imagine not dancing. Um, the first time I saw your work, I didn't really know anything about you. Mm -hmm. I just loved the work as pure dance. So um, forgive me if everybody already knows the answer to this question. Um, but. I'm curious about how you came to dance as a, you know, the 10th child of 12 children in a migrant family, didn't have a lot of education. How did you find dance? What does it mean to you? Can you talk a little bit mm -hmm. about you and being a dancer? Well, I've written a book called Last <laughs> Night on Earth. Me. And if you want a more in-depth answer, that would be a good place to go. Um, I went, to, I, we were fortunate at my school to have uh, hired a drama teacher. Now you're talking, this is a potato and fruit growing community in upstate New York. So I had familiarity with the stage and I went there uh, to the university with the idea of continuing to go to what I thought, what, what else was there? It was only Broadway. There was no other world. And uh, while pursuing sports and drama, I went to uh, take, um, modern, uh, no, an African dance class with Percival Board uh, and another woman whose name was uh, Linda Grandy, who had been in the uh, Humphrey Weidman, Charles Weidman, uh, Humphrey Weidman, oh, Char Hump Doris Humphrey, Charles Weidman Company. And I fell in love. I really fell in love with it. And um, once that happens to you, you don't let it go. That's how I came into dance. The avant-garde dance came when I met a, a wonderful woman whose name was Lois Welk. Yes, she was the niece of Lawrence Welk, uh, <laughs> but she was on the other end of the political spectrum. And Lois became a kind of mentor and friend, and we all were in San Francisco at that time. And she said she was coming back. Um, San Francisco was not the place for us to get our roots down, we're coming back to the East Coast. And we came back to the town that I'd gone to school in, which was Binghamton, New York. 
and that's um, Arnie Zane and I had met in 1971, so we became a duet team. That's how it all, that's how it all happened. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this evening and for decades of work. It's uh, really a gift to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about decades back, I first heard you on a panel in, at Brooklyn Academy of Music. It was Dance Black America, mm. which I think was around 1983 or oh something. Oh my God, you were there. Yes. <laughs> That's another, you've heard about Woodstock? Well, this was another defining moment she's talking about, yes? Do you know this one, this, about this moment? Before my time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and what has been, at that time, um, I remember there was a lot of tension <laughs> coming you to, to you from the audience because your work that a lot of people felt you weren't representing. Um, and I remember you responding and saying, you know, you, you're not interested in getting up on a soapbox. Mm. Um, well, now hold on, where, where are you going with the question? Because I want to... Where I'm going yeah. is I was very struck when you were talking about early in your dance making, mm. if, you know, or around the, the Woodstock era, if you just didn't talk about I was about not a dancer in Woodstock, I was 17. No, 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 yeah. okay. But just this climate where if you didn't talk about race, you could live in these alcoves, and that when you and Arnie began making work, it wasn't political, it was about your bodies. You're, you didn't, you weren't, it's, at least mm -hmm. as I understand it, you weren't yes. aware right. mm -hmm. that your bodies themselves were making a political statement. No, it was not. Okay. No. So this is kind of where I'm going with that. At, in 83, and then, you know, I heard you on a I think it was even, I think it was earlier than 83, but go on. Go okay. On. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard you then and a few other times um, assert that an artist doesn't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you still use those words, but you were the only person other artists may feel that way. You were very declarative yes. about it. Mm -hmm. Where I'm going is, you know, P.S., the work ended up breaking all these boundaries. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it is, at some point y you were a, a little more explicit or, or, or dealing with that kind of with those boundaries in a more mm. direct way. And I'm, am well, I? Well, under? I think I see where you're going. I just want to move us along. The, let, let, let's, make, let's go back to that day. First of all, it, there comes a moment when you are the, young, the youngsters. I was on a panel that was George Faison, who I think had already won a Tony for the Wiz at that time, Carmen de Lavalade, the very elegant uh, Carmen de Lavalade. A, a real, I think she had started, she and Alvin had both been working with Horton back in the, in, in the what was it, the 50s or something, before they got to New York. Uh, what's that? Yes, yeah, well you, and there were Tally Beatty, and somehow they, they squeezed this, who is this person? I am there on the panel as well. So, and I believe it, the name of the panel was The Future of Black Dance. I think that was the name of it. Someone could maybe correct me. Um, so the question was, uh, I said at one point, well, you know, I am, a, I am a man who is an artist who happens to be black. That was incendiary. <laughs> it was. It was incendiary. It was. And uh, I wonder if Mr. Hall would have heard about this discussion. Because I thought coming out of the counterculture and all and the Grand Union, the, the, the experiment, experimentalist downtown, you could just be what you wanted to be and you made the art you wanted to make. Mm. And I said that to that particular room, which had some very, very vocal people in it, and 
the room exploded. I said something like, well, you know, the subject matter can be like uh, Proust, who describes the space between two clouds. It must have sounded insufferable and pretentious, but it was truly the way, the way I felt, right? Uh, I remember there was a rush toward the stage. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, and bless her, may she rest in peace, Pearl Primus, who was the wife of, my, uh, per, of uh, Percival Board, my teacher, that, uh, the first classes I took at Binghamton, she came down and she said to me, Percival, uh, is turning in his grave. Oh. You, will, you will rue the day you said this. And she turned three times, three times, pointed to me and said, you will rue the day that you did this, right? Are you saying that Pearl Primus did voodoo on you? I don't know what you call it, but it was a ritual movement. It was a ritual movement. Wait, because of what on. I had said hold was Hold on so a second. Hold yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was, I had been so insulting somehow to say that I was a man and an artist before I was a black man. And you know, I, I, I've gone round and round about this. Now, uh, I was invited some years back at the Kennedy Center to be on uh, uh, black, Masters of Black Choreography or something panel, and I, protested because I felt that it was, I was being ghettoized, and I'm sure if that's an offensive term, but then I realized that I have a body of work that speaks for itself, and quite frankly, I think to be declared, to declare myself as a black man now is empowering to me. Hmm. You know, I know um, what I am. I know what I have done. I think I know even what I'm capable of, and part of that is great love for uh, being a black American. So you ask me where it is. Um, today, I spent the, sec the, the last hour before, bef two hours, three hours before you came, before I came up to see you, doing, you I talked about Dora and her transcript. The second piece is going to be called Analogy, Lance, Bad Boy, AKA the Escape Artist. My nephew, who is a man 44 years old, I was there when he was accepted into the San Francisco School of Ballet as an eight-year-old. He studied for three years. He dropped out. I asked him at that time. He loved me. We loved each other. He wanted to be like Uncle Bill. What happened? He told me at that time it was because he wanted to do real dance and that they were racist. Now I find out that he was actually uh, seeing a pederast mm -hmm. doing cocaine. Um, he tells me all these things. His life has gone from one calamity to another. Beautiful man. He has been a model. He has been a dancer, but has been ha his first hit of cocaine was when he was 10. Mm. So this next one, is that a politically engaged work to be talking about a young black man? There's a Jewish woman, 95. There's a 44-year-old black man who um, is paralyzed from the waist down has full-blown AIDS, and he's talking to me about his life. We were joking tonight, I was telling my um, associate, Janet Wong, about Stuart uh, Hill. Hall. Hall, yeah. Stuart Hall, and everything we know about um, co uh, cultural studies, we owe to him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, we're, 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 we're still doing cultural studies right now. Mm. Now, am I on stage doing this? But there is something very, very personal, very deep, and very risky about making this next work about him and the truth of his situation. So if you're asking me what happened to the being explicit, I call it age. And I think that it has, I, I have more, um, more tools in my toolbox. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to scream uh, anymore. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Which side of who's got it? Who's got it? Hi, Bill. How are Hi. you? Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> hey, look hey. who's here. <laughs> Good. Uh, I met this gentleman in uh, London, and he was in the, uh, the, uh, one of the 
the pillars of the Fela production there. And uh, you're now touring with the show. I was. I just got back. Okay. The show is <laughs> uh, another um, version of it has gone out. Thank yes. you. Um, first of all, I understand your journey in being trying to connect as a human being first. I find myself as a young African American going through that same experience too, and always being seen as black first and person second. What do you think, or what is your advice to me as a young African American, young? art maker, a young performer, trying to define my space in that, trying to make, become a theater maker, what is the, or my generation's responsibility in creating art? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's my cue line, right? <laughs> She's trying to give me that line. Mm -hmm. This has been quoted so many times. An artist does not have to do a goddamn thing. <laughs> An artist should be the freest among us, sometimes literally naked running down the street, thumbing their nose at all dogma and, and received wisdom. But an artist is a person, a man, a woman, transgender person, with a location, economic, educational. What does that person need to do? That person. Some people need to go burn down a building hopefully ritualistically. Other people need to go quietly into themselves. Some people need to declare that what I am doing is because I am black. Some people need to declare what I am doing is because I am human and I'm feeling. That's the first thing you have to do. Now, you live in a time of extreme self-consciousness about branding, about getting heard in a world where there are so many voices. But don't blame it on the world. Yeah? What do you need to do as an artist? Now that's how you, I can't answer it more closely than that. And then they, my dancers used to ask me, how much, what about freedom? I said, you can have as much freedom as you're willing to pay for. You remember that, right? Yes, yes. Yeah? You know, when you jete, you jump real high. The higher you jump, you gotta pay for it on the way down. <laughs> so are you ready to land? Do you have the technique? And I mean that in life and in art making. So good to see you. Likewise, thank You're you. You're looking very handsome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. yeah. Mm -hmm. So great to hear you speak and um, encounter your, your personhood firsthand. And it was really great to hear you speak about working with Merce Cunningham and encountering um, conceptualism as a way of uh, a means of making your work and um, I've been thinking this week like many people I've gotten sucked into the dialogue about Kenneth Goldsmith's performance at Brown uh, mm. last weekend and there's been a lot of no, say that once again you've been sucked into what now the, the all of the well of Kenneth Goldsmith's performance at Brown University a couple of weeks ago. Do you know about this? Help me about it. Help me. No, I don't. Maybe I do know. I don't know. What he was read um, a version that he kind of created of different versions of Michael Brown's autopsy as a, a poem at this experimental poetics conference at Brown. And um, it's been extremely controversial. There's been a lot of discourse about... Um, conceptualism as a type of colonialism and appropriation and colonialism. Um, a lot of different back and forth about that. Because they appropriate it somehow to the guise of conceptualism, they appropriated this, um, this event, his death. Is that what the, that's what the crime The is? document, like the actual autopsy, the, the language version of his mm -hmm. death, the language corollary of his death. Um, I guess the thing about what you said that got me thinking is how little familiar I am with um, conceptualists of color or the historical relationship between conceptualism and appropriation work and people of color. So hearing you speak about working with Merce Cunningham was really Not working with Merce Cunningham, but, but actually learning from Merce Learning from him, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I guess I just was curious to hear you, if you have any thoughts about um, kind of the historical relationship between conceptualism. Well, I'm and not sure if we're using the term in the same way. Do you know of an artist, like, you know, Fred Wilson? Yeah. 
Hi. Yes, yeah, he's the person who makes, he curates stuff in museums. Yes, and what do you call what he does? He literally goes into a museum and makes selections, organizing them, putting them together, and he calls those new works. I think he calls them new works, or they call them interventions or what have you. That's an extremely conceptual gesture that he made. And he oftentimes is uh, actually, I believe, investigating ideas we have about race and class and history purely through objects that he arranges. I find that is as exciting and, uh, and it's, it's conceptual. Now, uh, do you mean uh, this, this piece that you're describing, uh, I felt I'd hear when you said it, um, had he gone a step too far in using this um, very, very contested document, which is the autopsy, and using it for performance. Is that what you're, that's what the, some of the concerns people had, was that there, should, there are boundaries of good taste and sensitivity and that they shouldn't, we shouldn't confuse performance Yeah, and, with and specifically with his subject position as a white male at this extremely privileged um, institutional event, what it means for him as a person to get up and read this document as mm -hmm. his work of art. Um, I did not see the work, but I think he has every right to do it. Like I said, um, the artist should be the freest person. But I also say that you know, you go, how much freedom do you want? As much as you're able to pay for. Now he will be pillared on the internet. He will be, um, maybe have threats against him. He will have all sorts of things. Uh, is, did he know he was gonna do that? Was he naive when he went into it? And what, was her, what were his reasons for doing it? I don't know. Was it a compelling work? Was it moving to be in the room with it when it was happening? I don't know. These are all the questions I'd have to ask. And there's a whole, there's a, there's a lot of people. If you're interested, there's a, a, a MoMA under the, the um, direction of Ralph Lemon, a very important black choreographer who has the eye of a whole generation of makers. And he does talks on values at MoMA. I don't know if he's still doing them, but he's somebody you might want to Google and Ralph's thinking about this question of uh, race and artistic agency, I think he's a very fresh thinker and an important, important thinker. There are, do you know who David Hammond is? No. David Hammond was, um, <laughs> there was, he, he, when I was, I knew him, I, I still know him, but he's not, not close. At his loft up in Harlem, back before it was cool Harlem, you know, the Harlem's been gentrified right now, and uh, he, was, he had, uh, what do you call it, a, a lightning a pole, a, a, a pole with, you know, that you, what you find by the side of the road. Uh, a lightning rod. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh. Uh, pardon? Say it again? Lamppost. Lamppost, taller than lamppost, though. You know, like you go to a super highway and the electric lines run it. To, and at the very top of it was a basketball hoop. And he had it in a, 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 an abandoned, of which there used to be a lot, right? Abandoned lot in Harlem. And, and uh, he would just, he said he would sit there and watch as young dudes would come through with the basketball. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that high. And he called it higher goals. <laughs> uh, now, was that a work of sculpture or was that a conceptual work? It was very witty. But it was, it was having a lot of things where he's really smart in that way. Or he made a videotape. <laughs> where he, much sought after by many collectors, he, two things, he was in the middle of the winter selling snowballs down it. And of course he knew back early, years and years ago, he used, was using video to videotape it. People were buying them. And he did a piece where he's just kicking a can down the road. That's the whole video. He's kicking a can down the road, right? What is that, right? So that's a black conceptual artist at work. And very, and he's a senior statesman now. And there are people that that tradition now has really gone deep and wide. So um, you know, just we can't be we can't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid, and particularly artists. You know, don't be afraid. I, this is what I'm saying to me, the middle-aged man. Don't be afraid. That guy. I didn't see the work. I would never have occurred to me to do that. But I think I can see what he was going after. No. But thank you for that. That's, um, that's very, very touching. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Are we, uh, are we done yet? I think, <laughs> I think that we are, well, we're done with this part of our journey. I'll say it like that. <laughs> I just want to thank you. This was an amazing conversation. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.